My name's Paul Garner, and I work as a researcher and lecturer for Biblical Creation Trust. This is the first of two videos in which I'm going to take a look at some of the evidence of the biblical flood that we can see in the geological record of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. In many ways, Great Britain can be seen as the birthplace of modern geology. It was here that many rudiments of the geological column were first put together, especially the older Paleozoic part of the column, with the Cambrian, Ordovician and Silurian, named after ancient Welsh tribes, and the Devonian, named after the English county of Devon. It was here in Britain that many of the early geologists learned and employed their fieldcraft, here that the first geological map of an entire nation was drawn up by William Smith in 1815. And of course it was here that Hutton and Lyle propounded the uniformitarian ideas that would come to supplant the catastrophism of earlier generations, though often in the teeth of the field evidence, as later neocatastrophists such as Derek Ager would attest. Britain also holds a great deal of interest for the student of flood geology, it was in 17th century Britain that scholars like Thomas Burnett and John Woodward argued that the biblical flood was responsible for the Earth's topography, its rocks and its fossils. And it was here that in the 19th century the scriptural or mosaic geologists opposed Darwin's theory of evolution and defended views that would prefigure the later flood geology of MacReady Price and Whitcomb and Morris in the United States. So let's take a whistle-stop tour through the geology of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, pausing along the way to take in a few highlights, and to see how the global flood recorded in the book of Genesis has left its mark on our landscape. I want to begin in the northwest highlands of Scotland, where the oldest rocks in Britain are exposed. The Lewisian Nices are a series of intensely altered metamorphic rocks with a conventional age of up to 2.9 billion years. They form the crystalline basement of our country and from a creationist perspective probably represent creation weak rocks. On top of this eroded basement there's a thick sequence of unmetamorphosed red and brown sandstones, the Torridonian group. These rocks have very few fossils and it's unclear whether they represent pre-flood rocks or the earliest deposits of the flood. However, in the English Midlands, there are some outcrops of somewhat younger Precambrian rocks, conventionally dated to around 560 million years ago, that contain fossils of multicelled organisms, similar to those now known from several other parts of the world. We call these fossils Ediacarans. One of the most famous of these fossils is Charnia masoni, discovered by a schoolboy, Roger Mason, in the Charnwood Forest of Leicestershire in the 1950s. On the right, you can see the type specimen on display in the New Walk Museum in Leicester. These creatures, whatever they are, appear to have been rapidly smothered by the accumulating sediments and are probably among the first pre-flood organisms to have been buried during the flood. One of the most remarkable features of the rock record globally is the erosion feature known as the Great Unconformity, which marks the transition from the Precambrian to the rest of the rock record. This dramatic erosion surface can be seen on multiple continents, with perhaps the most famous example in Arizona's Grand Canyon. But it's also found in Britain. For example, here's an outcrop in Urkel Quarry in Shropshire, an English county on the border with Wales, where Precambrian volcanic rocks are overlain by Lower Cambrian quartzite sandstones. The whole sequence has been tilted so that the sandstone layers are now dipping about 40 degrees to the southeast. The Great Unconformity is unique in the rock record, a stark testimony to a time when the continents were being eroded to basement level, seemingly in association with the earlier stages of the global flood. In fact, sandstones of Cambrian age rest on the eroded Precambrian basement in England, Wales and Scotland. These sandstones contain the fossils of trilobites, now extinct marine arthropods with a segmented body. But interestingly, the trilobite assemblages in England and Wales are different from those in Scotland. 
It seems that during the early part of the flood, at the time these sandstones were being deposited, Scotland was perhaps 4,000 miles away from England and Wales, on the American side of a kind of proto-Atlantic ocean called Iapetus. During the flood, it seems that catastrophic plate tectonics, driven by runaway subduction, caused the Iapetus ocean plate to be consumed in the Earth's interior, so that the continents on either side converged and eventually collided with one another. When the modern Atlantic Ocean opened later in the flood, the split happened in a slightly different place, leaving Scotland accreted to the European plate on the other side. In the British Ordovician, we have evidence of the catastrophic volcanism associated with the destruction of the Iapetus Ocean Plate. As the plate dived into the Earth's mantle, it was subjected to melting, generating magmas that rose through the overlying crust and erupted explosively in the Snowdonia region of North Wales and in the Lake District of North West England. In those regions today, there are thick sequences of lavas, ashes, volcanic debris flows and ignimbrites, products of the most explosive types of volcanism. The Borodell volcanics of the Lake District, shown here, are conventionally thought to span some 10 million years of geological time, though it's hard to discern much evidence of it in the actual rocks. Some geologists pointed to the weathered tops of certain lava flows as evidence of the passage of time, until they realised in the late 1980s that these lava flows were actually igneous intrusions that were never exposed to weathering at the Earth's surface. Their reddened blocky tops were in fact the result of the hot magmas interacting with the wet sediments into which they were intruded. Next in the geological succession we have the Silurian, represented in parts of southern Scotland and northern England by black mudstones with fossils of colonial animals called graptolites, looking for all the world like tiny hacksaw blades preserved on the bedding planes of the rocks. By contrast, around the Welsh borders and in the English Midlands, there are outcrops of Silurian limestones, with abundant fossils of shallow marine invertebrates such as trilobites, brachiopods, crinoids and corals. Sometimes the crinoids are still articulated, and the trilobites often rolled up for protection, indicating that they were rapidly buried, probably while the animals were still alive. Eventually, the destruction of the Iapetus ocean plate led to the smashing together of the continents on either side, resulting in dramatic uplift and erosion, as well as the intrusion of igneous rocks and metamorphism. This episode is known as the Caledonian orogeny, or mountain building. Caledonian structures such as these folds in Silurian grits at Crookdale Crag in Cumbria testify to the immense tectonic forces that were involved. Next we come to the Devonian. Lower Devonian churts at Rhiney in Scotland are justly famous for their exceptional preservation of plant fossils mostly small vascular plants that lack true roots and leaves. Dr Kurt Wise has proposed that one of the major biomes of the pre-flood world was a continent-sized floating forest that grew out over the deep ocean. During the flood, this floating forest was ripped apart from the outside in, with the small water-dependent plants at the margins buried first, and among these would have been the plants at Rhiney. In Scotland, Wales and some parts of England, the Devonian is also represented by thick deposits of sandstones, siltstones and breccias, commonly known as the Old Red Sandstone. Many of these rocks show signs of rapid deposition under high energy conditions and are conventionally interpreted as the products of flash floods. Other Old Red Sandstone rocks contain well-preserved fossil fishes, such as this one from my own collection apparently representing episodes of mass mortality. Carboniferous limestones and gritstones make up the so-called backbone of England, 
the Pennine Mountains that separate the northwest side of the country from the northeast. These limestones are very similar in appearance and fossil content to the Carboniferous limestones of the United States, such as the Redwall limestone in Grand Canyon. Stratigraphically above the limestones and gritstones are the coal measures, with extensive coal seams comprising the remains of club mosses and other plants that were once growing in the central part of the pre-flood floating forest. At Glasgow in Scotland, the casts of several tree stumps are on display in Victoria Park, preserved exactly where they were found in 1887. A field investigation by Kurt Wise has shown that these trees didn't grow here, but were transported into place, consistent with the floating forest model. Like the Carboniferous limestones, the coal measures are incredibly extensive and similar coal-bearing sequences can be traced all the way from the coal basins of Pennsylvania and Illinois to the Ukraine in Eastern Europe. In part two of the talk, we'll take up the story with the dramatic tectonics of the Variscan orogeny before looking at the deposits of the later part of the flood and the post-flood period. <laughs>